over, over Christmas, I uh, had some holidays, and uh, there was this one moment where I was away. Uh, first of all, we visited my wife's family in Meriburrah, and then uh, my family down in Coffs Harbour. Most of my siblings live there, apart from my brother Mike. And, uh, and we're sitting around, and it was all my nieces and nephews and my kids, and I think we were playing cards or something, which is what we love to do when we're uh, all together hanging out, to go to the beach in the morning, have a great lunch, and then, you know, uh, play cards or a board game in the afternoon. Uh, but something happened that had never happened before. My then 16-year-old daughter, Emerson, said to me, Dad, how did you and Mum meet? How did you start going out? And we, you know, she started asking all these questions, and we're kind of looking at each other like, are we ready to tell the story? You know, it's a pretty complicated story. We started going out the week I turned 17. I was, you know, down at Ferny Grove High in grade 12, and, uh, you know, we started going out, and then we broke up. And Emerson said, um, why did you break up for the first time? And, and how did you get back together the first time? And then why did you break up the second time? <laughs> and we're like, oh, man, and we were looking at each other, being like, which bit are you going to tell? Which bit am I going to tell? Are we okay to even tell this story, you know? It gets worse because she said, well, when you were broken up the second time, Dad, did you have any other girlfriends and what were they like? What were their names? <laughs> did you kiss any of them? Did you think you maybe were going to marry them instead of mum? And we're like, oh, my goodness, we are not ready to, you know, to tell this story. And, I, and we told the story of how, um, no, 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 well, this one girl, but anyway, it's complicated. And we told the story uh, of how we, you know, got back together and how we got engaged and got married and, you know, the rest is history, as they say. But what struck me in that moment is just like, oh, man, like, how do you tell that story? Which parts do you leave out? Some, some pretty embarrassing bits in there and we made some dumb decisions. There's some things in that story I'm not so proud of. Which things do you put in, you know? Do I tell the story in such a way that I'm the hero and my wife is also the hero? Or, or the villain? Like, how, how do you tell that story? And what struck me as we were kind of navigating through this incredibly awkward conversation with all my nieces and nephews listening in, including Isla, our 12-year-old, and I'm like, man, I'm not ready for my 12-year-old to know about my dating history. Like, but what struck me as we were telling the story is what we thought of as just everyday life, just moments in our lives, just, just decisions that we made the day-to-day -day stuff of growing up and being a high schooler and a young adult and going to uni and having a girlfriend and breaking up and praying, is she the one, isn't she the one? And all of those moments, looking back, they actually created our story. You know, you actually, you write your story moment by moment. But in the moment, no one thinks one day I'm going to have to tell my kids this story. When I'm 18 years old thinking, do I get back together with my girlfriend? I'm not thinking in 25 years' time, I'm going to have to tell that story to my kids. Right? You write your story moment by moment, decision by decision. What you think of now as just today and the decisions you're making today, in the future will be part of your story. Bit by bit, day by day, moment by moment. You can probably look back and see chapters in your life where you think, oh man, that's not a great chapter. That chapter's filled with stupidity or tragedy or uncertainty, indecision, poor decision. Maybe you've got chapters in your story uh, that you're embarrassed about and wish you never had to tell anybody. And what struck me as we were telling the story is I thought, man, I'm glad I made some good decisions in that moment. Man, I'm glad that we had some good people around us. Man, I'm glad that we sought wisdom. We, st we still made mistakes, of course, but to be able to, t to write the story day by day, moment by moment. When you look back on your story, whether or not it's a story that you're happy to tell or a story you're ashamed to tell is determined by the decisions you make in those moments, moment by moment, decision by decision. Whether or not you're prepared to tell your kids or your grandkids your story without editing, without leaving out significant uh, periods of your life, 
Whether or not you're proud of your story or ashamed of your story is determined by the decisions you make every day in your story. The decisions you make in this season, in this chapter, will shape your story. So will you be the hero or the villain? What story are you writing day by day? I want to look at the, uh, the book of Proverbs. Uh, Proverbs, a beautiful book about godly wisdom, wisdom for life, the, the path that, you, that, that leads to life and prosperity and blessing and the path that leads to death and destruction and disappointment. That's the book of Proverbs often contrasts these two ways to live, these fork in the road moments. You can either make this decision and live that way, tragedy, or make this decision and live this way and it leads to life. There's this beautiful verse in chapter uh, 27, Verse 12, it says, the prudent see danger, the prudent see danger and take refuge, but the simple keep going and pay the penalty. Did you capture that? The prudent see danger and take refuge. The prudent, they, they look ahead and they kind of think, hang on, hang on, hang on. I see what's going on here. They, they connect the dots. They see the trajectory of where things are headed and they make a decision to, to change the course of action, right? But not so the, uh, the foolish or the simple. They keep going and pay the penalty. The prudent see where things could be heading if they keep going this direction. They take evasive action, they change the course, and it leads to life and blessing, refuge, safety, security, prosperity. But the foolish, they just plow on they never stop and ask, hang on, what story am I writing? What decisions am I making now that are going to affect my life into the future? One of the, uh, the, one of the ways to navigate this, this part of life is to ask yourself the legacy question. The legacy question is, what story do I want to tell? When all is said and done, what legacy am I leaving? What story do I want to tell? When I look back years from now and my kids or my grandkids ask me the question, tell us about, I'm able to tell the story without editing out the, the, the bad decisions because I've made good decisions the whole way through. What legacy do I want to leave? And this is important because no one thinks about legacy. Everyone just thinks about today. But the decisions you make today are cumulative and write your story and paint a picture of your legacy. So what kind of story are you telling? What's your legacy going to be? What story do you want to tell? And this is really important because the story you tell is not just about you. Do you know that? Your story impacts other people. You're not the only one in your story. Like you might achieve all of your goals, but those around you suffer. You know, instead of asking the question, how's my life working out for me? We should rather ask the question, how is my life working out for those closest to me? Like you might achieve all of your goals. You get the master's degree, you read a hundred books, you get the, the gains from the gym, you become, you know, fluent in five languages, you learn every instrument, you start your own business, you achieve all of your goals and you think, wow, I'm, I'm winning at life. But those around you are suffering because you haven't been there for them. You've neglected them. You've prioritized your own goals instead of relationship with them and care for them. You might think you've won, but when you look around you, you realize, oh, actually, my life hasn't worked out so well for those closest to me. It's a legacy question. What story do I want to tell? So in those key moments in life, we've got to stop and ask the question, what story do I want to tell? Because every decision you make now becomes part of your story uh, into the future. I mean, maybe, maybe your story is, you know, I was asked to lie to the client at work. I lied, I got caught out, and I got fired. And now my story is lied and lost his job. That's a terrible story. I mean, maybe you were asked to lie by your boss to the client, and you said, no, I'm not prepared to do that. And you lost your job anyway. So now your story is got asked to lie, refused to lie, lost his job. That's a better story. It's still a tough story, but it's a better story. Or maybe your story is, there was this guy, you know, and he was okay, I guess. 
And we kind of ended up together. No one else was really around. No one else was on the horizon. And after a while, we kind of just ended up, I guess, going out. And after two years of being in this relationship, things just fizzled out. And I look back on that chapter of my life and I think, what was that all about? It's decisions that you make that write a story. Or maybe your story is about uh, perseverance and diligence. Your friends keep saying to you, come out, come out, come out. And you keep saying, I have an assignment due. I've got an exam tomorrow. And you choose to stay home and study and work. And decision by decision, exam by exam, assignment by assignment, you, you pass subject by subject and you end up with a degree that sets you up uh, for a f- fruitful occupation. Maybe that's your story. Each decision you make paints a picture of your story. And I want to look today at at Joseph's story in the Old Testament. Joseph's story is a brilliant example of the legacy question. What kind of story do I want to tell? What is my life going to be about? In those key and critical moments when I've got a fork in the road where I can choose one way or another way, The decisions I make there have a cumulative effect and they tell my story, not just for me, but for those around me. So we're going to have a look at uh, Joseph. The good news is we're not going to read out all 13 chapters. I encourage you to do that. I sat down and read from 37 to 46 this morning. Uh, Beautiful. And I thought, man, it's a shame we can't have church for four hours, hey, and just read the whole of Genesis. Um, I encourage you to do that. Joseph's story is a story all about the legacy question. It's a story about writing a good story about God's uh, sovereignty and hand on Joseph. Um, Joseph's story takes place about 1,800 years ago in Israel and then down into Egypt. Uh, Joseph, if you don't know, at the start of the story, is about 17 years old. He's the 10th of 12 sons in a well-to-do family with a substantial agricultural business. And he's his father's favorite son because he's the son of his father's favorite wife. So Joseph is spoiled, he's favored, and he's uh, 17 years old. And one day he finds himself in a no-win situation. No-win situation, not of his own making. He doesn't make a bad decision and get into trouble. This happens to him, he's the victim here, but he still gets to choose how he responds. One day his 10 brothers, Uh, who are jealous of Joseph, decide, you know what, we should just get rid of him. We should just kill him. Cooler heads prevail, and instead of killing him, they decide to sell him into slavery to some passing, passing Ishmaelites on their way to Egypt. So they sell Joseph into slavery. They take his ornate robe, his father's uh, present to him, as a favored son, and they smear it with animal blood, and they come back to their father and they say, Dad, we are so sorry. We found this. Joseph has obviously been killed by a wild animal. Your son is dead and lost. That's a pretty terrible story. Don't you reckon? Imagine that. Oh, yeah, me and nine of my brothers were jealous of our our 10th brother, Yep, so we decided, 11th brother, we decided to uh, fake his death, break our father's heart, and sell him into slavery. And now the rest of us have this pact we have to keep for the rest of our lives, this secret that eats away at us inside because we are now liars for life. Imagine that on a first date. So tell me some of your story. Well, when we were growing up, uh, me and my brothers uh, faked our other brother's death, sold him into slavery, lied to our father, broke his heart, destroyed our family, never been the same since. And I live with that guilt every single day of my life. How about you? Uh, I have two cats. (laughs) My favorite show is Grey's Anatomy, you know. Imagine that. They make this decision that drastically changes their life. It leaves a ragged and broken legacy for that family. Joseph uh, ends up in slavery, not his fault, and he's got a decision to make. Do I try and run away? He ends up being sold to Potiphar, a a commander of the uh, palace guard, so a Egyptian um, 
official, wealthy, connected, powerful guy, Potiphar. He gets sold to Potiphar, and he's got to decide, do I try and run away, first chance I get, knowing that I might be hunted down and killed? Do I just drag my heels and be the worst slave ever and just do a terrible job serving my master? Or, out of reverence for God, do I love and serve my Egyptian master, Potiphar? What am I going to choose? What story am I telling? What's my legacy going to be? And Joseph chooses to serve Potiphar well. He serves Potiphar's household. And eventually, Potiphar notices that everything Joseph touches turns to gold. God is blessing him in his work. And Potiphar gives him more and more responsibility until there's a point where where Joseph is Potiphar's chief steward. He's in charge of everything except for Potiphar's wife. He runs the show. So he's in a favored and trusted position, living with a fair bit of luxury for a slave in Potiphar's household. That's Joseph's story. But then someone else's story collides with Joseph's story, and we have Potiphar's wife. And she's got a decision to make as well, and she chooses to try to seduce, to try to to, to seduce Joseph. Like, imagine that on, on your record. So tell me about yourself, well married to Potiphar, um, blackmailed one of his slaves to become my lover, uh, one of my many lovers actually, and uh, ruined his life, betrayed my husband. Yeah, how about you? Well, she's got to decide what her story and her legacy is going to be. What decision is, 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 uh, is she going to make? So she says to him, come and be my lover. And Joseph once again is in a lose-lose scenario. Lose-lose. He's like, okay, on one hand, I could have an affair with my master's wife. Then I would betray his trust. I would dishonor God. I would actually hurt and use her as well. And I'd probably end up executed when Potiphar found out. Doorway number one. Doorway number two. I could refuse and probably end up killed as well. It's a lose-lose, death-death situation for Joseph. One of the things he does, which is so powerful, is he, he recounts his story in that moment. So one of the ways you write a good story, one of the ways you have a great legacy, is in those critical moments, you retell the story up until that point, and you project it forward. This is, this is what, what Joseph does. He says, um, you know, um, Mrs. Potiphar, um, he, here's my story. Uh, I was a slave, came to this land as a slave. I had nothing going for me. Um, I was on the chopping block, on the, uh, the, you know, the sales block. I was bought by your husband, and through God's help and your husband's trust, I've built, uh, built up um, myself here, and now I don't worry about anything. In fact, I'm, I have everything I need, and I'm able to serve my master and honor God. Uh, Verse 8 of chapter 39. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself for anything in the house. Everything he owns, he's entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you're his wife. Joseph retells the story. I came here as a slave. My master put me in charge. God looked after me. He's withheld nothing from me except for you. How could I sin against him? How could I sin against God? And he's kind of saying, "Um, Mrs. Potiphar, are you sure you want seduced a Hebrew slave on your resume? Are you sure you want this as part of your story? Is that the kind of legacy you want to leave in life? And then Joseph so beautifully puts this decision in the context of the big story, his big story. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? 
It's like my story's turning out pretty good. I mean, from the time I was sold into slavery to this point now, things have gone pretty well. How could I sin against God? How could I betray my master's trust? You know, story number one uh, was sold into slavery, bought by Potiphar, grew up in his household, took on more and more responsibility, had an affair with his wife. Story number two, born into slavery, or sold into slavery, purchased by Potiphar, given more and more trust and responsibility, blessed by God, chose not to have an affair with Potiphar's wife. Which story do I want to tell? Like Joseph recounts what is happening in real time in his conversation with Potiphar's wife. He says, no, I'm not going to do that. She then is so hurt by that that she accuses, Pot, uh, accuses Joseph of, having, of uh, trying to rape her and he's arrested and thrown into jail. And something important here I want you to see. Sometimes you can make good decisions. The right, you do the right thing and it still doesn't work out for you because someone else hijacks your story. Someone else's brokenness and dysfunction takes control of your story like Potiphar's wife did for Potiphar, sorry, did for Joseph. But in those moments, God hasn't forgotten about you. Like maybe that's your story today. Like you feel like I did my best, I tried to serve God, I did the right thing and I still got screwed over. It wasn't my fault. And now you think your story's over. You think it's the end of the road for you. You think things are never going to turn around. And if that's you, I just want you to know your story is not over yet. God has not forgotten about you. He still sees you. He still has plans to bless you and prosper you. The chapter that you in that you are in now is not your whole story. There's a hope and a future for you. God has things in mind for you that are immeasurably more than you could hope or even imagine. He has good works for you to do. He wants to heal you and prosper you and restore you. He has chapters that aren't yet written in your story. Joseph could have thought, this is the end for me. I'm in jail. I'm done. I'm never going to get a second chance. My story's never going to change. And of course, because God's involved, it can change and it will change and it does change. And I just want this to be an encouragement to you that it is not over for you. It is not over for you. Several years later, Several years later, Joseph's now like 30. He's been in jail for a long time. Two other prisoners are in there, the chief baker and the chief cupbearer, two high officials because they can both poison the pharaoh, they can both poison the king. They're both in jail, they both have a dream. Joseph interprets the dream for them. One of them is restored to a place of honor, the other is... Uh, beheaded and impaled, not so good news for him. And Joseph says, remember me when, when you're in front of Pharaoh, remember me, remember that I helped you, that, I, you know, that God gave me the ability to, to um, interpret your, your dream and that it came true. Don't forget me, don't forget me. There's this tragic line uh, in the story where it says, but the cupbearer did not remember Joseph. Oh. Tragic. Time goes on. Pharaoh has a dream and he can't interpret it either. He has two dreams actually. He has one, wakes up, goes back to sleep, has another one. And he can't understand it, but he knows it's significant. He asks all of his magicians and wise men and sages what they think. They can't answer it. And then the cupbearer goes, oh yeah, I remember this guy, uh, Joseph from jail. Um, he can answer your, he can interpret your dreams, Pharaoh. So Joseph gets dragged from jail into the throne room. They make him have a shower and shave first. That's in the text. You can look at that for yourself. He comes in fresh, cleanly shaven, and he comes in and Pharaoh says, so I hear you can interpret my dreams. And Joseph says, no, I can't. But God can. What's your dream? And Pharaoh tells him these two dreams, one about seven fat cows that get eaten by seven skinny cows, one about seven fat um, sheaves of grain, grain that get eaten up by seven skinny and um, sketchy sheaves of grain. And Joseph says, well, here's what it means, Pharaoh. God has given me the answer. It means you're going to have seven years of a bumper crop, 
Seven years of incredible prosperity and then seven years of the most extreme famine you've ever seen. That's what the dream means. And then Joseph does something that no one ever does in front of Pharaoh and that is offer unsolicited advice. Hey, Pharaoh, here's what you should do. And everyone's like drawing the sword, being like, do we kill him now or do we arrest him first? Like, what's the protocol here? Joseph says, what you should do is put someone in charge of this. Pharaoh, someone's got to get up every single day thinking about this problem, managing the seven bumper years, putting aside grain. You know, this is a culture that lives on bread. Grain is life. It's like two-minute noodles for high school kids. It's the staple diet, right? Someone's got to get up every single morning and think just about this. On their mind every day, storing the grain, storing the grain, storing the grain. And then when the bad years come and the food runs out, opening up the storehouses and distributing the grain. This is a massive project to feed a nation. In fact, the nations around are going to need to be fed as well. We're going to become rich by selling grain. And Pharaoh's like, you should do this, Joseph. You're, you're, you're the one. In fact, he says, can we find anyone like this man in whom is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, and there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace, all my people, and submit, all my people will submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. In the morning, Joseph wakes up. He's a long-term prisoner in jail. In the afternoon, he's prime minister of the world superpower. That's, that's a big day. That's a big day. Pharaoh puts him in charge of everything. God blesses him, restores him, honors him, positions him to have an impact on a nation, to bless and support a whole nation of people, nations of people, actually. As, a, as the food runs out, his brothers get sent by their father, but not Benjamin. The youngest Benjamin stays behind because Jacob says, I cannot lose two younger sons of my favorite wife. Joseph's already dead. Benjamin's never leaving my side ever. He sends out the other 10 and they travel all the way to Egypt and they go to Joseph and they ask for food and Joseph recognizes them, but they don't recognize him. Why, why would they? They think he's dead and gone. They're not expecting him to be prime minister of Egypt. And they come and they bow down before him. He speaks through a translator and he decides to test their integrity, to see if they have changed. And he basically says to them, go and get your younger brother and bring him here and leave him with me. And they're like, we can't do that. We can never betray our younger brother. It would break our father's heart. In other words, they've started to grieve and change and repent from what they did to Joseph. Over quite a few chapters, Joseph tests them again and again to test their integrity. And in the end, when he can't keep it in any longer, he reveals himself. He's like, you guys, it's me, Joseph. And they hug and cry and hug and cry and hug and cry. It's an amazing moment, an amazing moment. But in that moment, Joseph can choose between bitterness and revenge or between forgiveness and life. It's a legacy question. What story do I want to tell? My brothers betrayed me. Potiphar took me on. His wife screwed me over, ended up in jail. The cupbearer abandoned me. Years later, Pharaoh made me prime minister. My brothers came and I got revenge. And now I live in luxury in Pharaoh's palace. Or my brothers came to me and I forgave them and blessed them and healed them and restored them and saved my family. What story do you want to tell? And Joseph chooses the path of life. He chooses a path of life. And in the end, the whole family moved down to Egypt and 70 people, because there's going to be no food for a long time, but seven year famine, and they prosper and they grow and the family becomes a nation. And 400 years later, there comes Moses to lead the people out of Egypt into freedom, into the promised land. It's an amazing story, isn't it? There's this beautiful line uh, partway through when Joseph is talking to his brothers and he says this. But Joseph said to them, 
Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended good. Sorry, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. When you read Joseph's story, you realize, yeah, Joseph is writing the story through a series of good decisions that paint a beautiful picture and leave a legacy. But he's not the only one writing the story. Do you realize that? God is writing Joseph's story too. Joseph realizes, he says, you intended this for harm, but God intended it for good. God saw this was a way to save many lives from the coming famine. 13 years earlier, probably longer even, God knew that there was going to be a famine in Israel, and he decided to save our family by orchestrating these conditions and situations and events that I might be in the place of power and responsibility to save our family and bless our nation. What you intended for harm, God has used for good. You're not the only one writing your story. God is writing your story too. You can trust him. So the question is, what story are you going to write? What decisions are you going to make? Decision by decision, moment by moment to tell a story. I want to just let you know that when, if you wait to the last minute to make these decisions, you make bad decisions. Like 11.30 at night when you're alone is not the time to decide, will I sleep with my girlfriend or not? That, that's the wrong time for that conversation. You've got to have that conversation, that decision in the cold, hard light of day. Um, a few years ago, uh, I went to New Zealand uh, for family holiday, and I went bungee jumping. Anyone been bungee jumping? There's me. Uh, so this is Nevis uh, in Queenstown, 143 meters high, eight and a half seconds of free fall, speeds of 130 kilometers per hour before the cord kicks in and yanks you back up. I decided I was going to go bungee jumping, and I did, and then you get there, and the guy's like, you know, you go out on this tiny little, um, it's like a shopping trolley on wires, basically, and you go out to this platform suspended across this gorge. You can see it in the picture there, just on wires, and they harness you up, and they weigh you like a thousand times, and then they, the guy's like, forward, 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 and so you're standing on a pizza box with your toes dangled over the edge, and he's holding the back of your harness, and he's like, all right, wave to the cameras, and you're like, I can't believe I'm doing this. He waved to the camera, he waved to the other camera, and then he says, right, we're going to do a countdown, three, two, one, and bungee, three, two, one, bungee, and when I say bungee, you jump, and you've got to do like this big swan dive, you know, jump out as far as you can, big dive, three, two, one, bungee. Are you ready? And I can tell you, at that moment, the last thing I wanted to do was jump off that little pizza box size, you know? ledge into this enormous gorge with a rubber band around my ankles. Like, I like risk, I like being up high, I love going fast, all that, but I stood there and I thought, this is stupid. Why would I want to do this? But the day before, I made my decision. This is the key thing. I did all my agonizing, all my catastrophizing, all of my will I, won't I, should I, shouldn't I, the day before. And I wrestled with it, and then I made up my mind. I said, I'm going to do it. When he says, three, two, one, bungee jump, I am going to jump. I've already decided ahead of time what I'm going to do in that situation. I'm not waiting till then to decide. Because I know I make a good decision then. I'm going to be paralyzed with fear. I've got to decide ahead of time, and I did. I made up my mind the day before that I was going to jump on jump. So I stood there, three, two, one, bungee, and I jumped. I did this massive big dive. I think got a picture there. There we go. That's the moment of no return. <laughs> it was awesome. It was terrifying. Afterwards, the guy said, you can do it again for another 100 bucks. And I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm fine. It's terrifying but I made up my mind ahead of time. And this is the secret to leaving a great legacy. 
Don't wait to the heat of the moment with Potiphar's wife saying, Joseph, come to bed with me to decide about your sexual purity. Don't wait until you're in the moment where you can sign a dodgy business deal to decide, am I going to be a person of integrity in business? Don't decide when you're on your way to your own wedding, is this the one? Right? Work that out ahead of time. Don't decide what kind of parent you're going to be at 2 a.m. when your kids are crying or when your toddler just smashed something on the floor or your 17-year-old wrote off your car. Don't decide then what kind of parent am I going to be. Decide ahead of time. This is how you leave a great legacy. You say, Lord, and just as, as a team come back up, we're going to pray in a moment. You say, Lord, I want to be someone who chooses the path of life. In those moments when I can become bitter and critical or self-indulgent or superior to others, I'm going to choose rather to be gentle and generous and self-controlled and show integrity. Those moments where I can either wimp out or step out in faith, I'm going to choose faith. Because your story is not just about you. It's about leaving a legacy that blesses generations. And I don't know about you, but I want to be someone that my grandchildren look at how I lived my life and said, I'm so thankful for my granddad. The way he lived his life, the decisions he made, the story he wrote has blessed me so richly. So I just want to ask you today, just as we close, we're going to pray to, to make the decision now to leave a great legacy. This is especially important, important as you approach transitions in life, finishing uni, starting in the workplace, getting married, having kids for the first time, changing jobs, retiring, doing your estate planning. These are the times where you have to decide what kind of person am I going to be? What kind of legacy am I going to leave? And remember, of course, it's not just you. God is writing your story too. The Holy Spirit is in you if you're a follower of Jesus. He's shaping your life, transforming your mind, healing your heart, going before you into every battle, making a way where there is no way, opening doors that no one can close and closing doors that no one can open. God is with you. He is for you. And He wants to bless you. And He wants you to make decision after decision that write a beautiful and glorious story that blesses people for generations to come. Why don't we stand and we're going to pray together. Let's pray. Yeah, Holy Spirit. Oh Lord, I thank you for Joseph's story. Oh, there's just so much richness in it, Lord. Every opportunity that he had to become hard-hearted and selfish and vindictive, Lord, or self-entitled, he didn't. Your hand was on him. You blessed him. You favored him. And he made godly decision after godly decision that blessed his family and generations to come. And Lord, I just want to say, and will you join with me as I pray, Lord, I just want to say that I want to do the same. I'm deciding now, ahead of time, not in the heat of the moment, to choose the way of life, to respond to the Spirit's leading, to follow the voice of the Good Shepherd, to take the narrow path, to swim against the flow, Lord, I want to choose to honor you, even if it costs me, even if others hijack my story. I'm choosing the path of integrity. I'm choosing the path of righteousness. I'm choosing the path of forgiveness and grace and courage. And Lord, for those of us facing a significant decision, Lord, or a life transition, I especially pray for us, Lord. I pray that we would remember that you are writing our story, that the chapter we are in is not the end of our story that you use all things together for good for those that love you. That integrity and grace and love and mercy and faith and compassion and justice, Lord, that's the path to life. And you are calling us, Lord, to walk into that, that we might know you deeply, deeply, deeply and experience the joy of our salvation and to leave a legacy that blesses generations to come. Amen. Amen. Yeah, thank you.